Well, we're going to pick things up in the book of Romans. We're going to look at Romans chapter 3. Um, but maybe just quickly before we jump in, sometimes when, I, when I'm working through a passage of Scripture, for whatever reason, I just... I get certain images, I get certain ideas, certain thoughts that, that come into my brain as I think of them. And as I was working my way through this passage a couple of weeks ago, I couldn't help but think of my own family. And I don't know if this is like your family, especially if you have young kids, but every once in a while in our house, like we have a lot of fun, and usually this is done in good jest. It's, maybe there's a little slight bit of truth behind it. But all of a sudden you'll hear one of our kids or two of our kids, and they'll say it to one of their other siblings, um, sometimes, they, believe it or not, they might even say it to their mom and dad, but they just say something like this, like, no, just, just stop. Please, please, just do yourself a favor, do us all a favor, and just, just stop. Has anybody had kids, teenagers do that to you? Okay, you, you know what that's like. Now, usually the reason why we get told to ju just please just stop, right? The reason why we usually get, and that's usually how they do it with like all these weird kind of little breaks and stuff, is because maybe somebody is trying to sing, maybe addition, you know, for what they think is American Idol or something, and it's probably not up to Ky Simon Cowell's expectation and needs to be stopped partway through. Sometimes they're like, you know, wanting to like demonstrate their not so killer dance moves for everybody. But probably most often is somebody is guilty of something, Usually it's just some kind of minor infraction. They stole the last piece of dessert or were sneakily like eating it behind everybody's back and then you go expecting it to be there and it's gone. And then you just look to the, the face that looks the most guilty. And then they try to defend their case. And usually by defending it, they're just digging themselves a deeper hole. And we're like, just, just stop, right? You can't, you can't get yourself out of this one. Well, the reason why I do that is because in many ways when we're looking at this passage, it's partly like trying to defend yourself before a holy God, right? And before we open our mouths, it's almost like it's like, before you open your mouths, before you go there, you might just want to think the smartest thing to do is just remain silent. Just stop. Consider whose presence you're in. But we'll get there in just a moment. Um, we're going to pick things up. I'm going to just give a little bit of review. It's been about two weeks since we've done here. And one of, the, one of the things that I'm realizing is one of the problems with Romans, and that sounds bad, one of the problems with this book of the Bible, but uh, don't take it that way. <laughs> it's a great book. But it's, it's a really long, drawn-out argument. And Paul is building a case, and he's building it kind of point by point, piece by piece. And one of the things I was mentioning a couple weeks, if you just look at one section on its own, you might think you know what he's, Paul's talking about, but completely miss it or misrepresent it because that's just one portion in a much larger argument that Paul is making. So one of the things that you kind of want to do is just keep going and this is where we've come from, this is where we're going so that you can see each section based on what it's built upon. So let me just try to move really quickly through some Really, really simple review. Um, Paul, again, he's writing this to a group of believers in the, the capital city of the Roman Empire, so the city of Rome. And one of the challenges that uh, Paul is, is writing this letter to is this church is now made up of what we would call this traditional, conservative, culturally Jewish people, right? Both culturally, both religious, kind of have a tr traditional conservative sense, but they're now bringing in uh, non-Jewish people, right? Uh, these Gentiles with this Roman and Greek influence, and their worlds are completely diverse. And they're like, how do we make this work? And they're worried, well, we know what the Romans and the Greeks are like, and, and if they come in, they're going to corrupt, corrupt what we have here, so how do we make this new, new situation work? And one of the things Paul really likes to get out. He says, you know, don't think of this as some sort of obstacle that you have to overcome and deal with. He's not saying this isn't going to be an issue, that there's not going to be any problem, that it's all going to be wonderful. But he actually tells them, this is what your holy scriptures have been pointing to. This day when Jew and Gentile can come together and be part of a united family of faith. Right? This isn't an obstacle. This is an opportunity. This is a beautiful thing. This is the whole point of the gospel to bring these two groups, these two diverse people together in the same wonderful, beautiful family of faith under Jesus Christ. Again, I've always mentioned that the key verse 
I think to help un- unlock and understand the book of Romans is verse 17. This is the verse that kind of hinges from the introduction to his main argument. It's verse and it, where Paul writes, for in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And so that key word, and that finally today we're gonna look again at that word, the righteousness, and what Paul means by it might be not be what we think when we hear the word righteousness. But as soon as he brings this up, it's almost like he forgets it, and finally today he's gonna bring up and explain to us what this righteousness is and what it looks like and why it matters. But as soon as he does this, he brings about something else that is revealed, which is the anger of God, the wrath of God, and he said that's also on display, and that's for everyone who's got eyes to see it, right? Anybody who goes out, steps outside their front door, anybody who turns on their TV screens, anybody who looks even just in their own dysfunction, in their own families, in their own workplaces, in their own schoolyards, right, can see that there's something broken in the world around us. Paul says the reason why that happens is because we've exchanged the glory of God the creator for the created things, for lesser things, and God says he turns us over to those things, to those desires, to those appetites, but it creates a fair bit of collateral damage and we see it at work. But then Jesus, or then Paul does something very unique. He says when you're looking at it and you see how bad the world is, and you, can, you think about again these traditional Jewish people worried about this coming in to corrupt them, he does something strange. He says, but be careful not to judge them because when you judge them you're actually judging yourself. Right, because if we're honest, we're all guilty at some level or another of the same things. Right, our house is not always in order. And then what we looked at uh, last time was this idea, again, if you just looked at that section itself, was it almost looked like this idea that we can be saved through our own good deeds, through our own works, through our own good behavior. And Paul's gonna dismantle that for us this week, but he decides, okay, if we have to step outside and we have to have our own righteousness, if it's not this righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus, it must be righteousness that, that we bring ourselves. But what would that look like first for the Jew, and then what would that look like for the Gentile? And they have to be slightly different because for the Jewish people, they were given the law of the Lord, and he walks through, through that. For the Gentile, they don't have that, but there's certain things that should be plain to them. And then as he gets there, he ends, he gives them basically this scenario. Wouldn't a Gentile who unknowingly keeps the law even though he's never been exposed to it, and even though he isn't circumcised, be a better candidate for God's grace than a Jew who has the law and the sign of circumcision, but still as a lawbreaker doesn't follow it, right? So it's this idea, you could be a Jew, you could be in person, you could have have the sign, you could have this thing, but if you don't follow it, is that gonna save you? But this person who doesn't have it, but still tries, wouldn't that put them in better standing before God? And then this leads to this, first question where we're gonna pick this up. He goes, if that's the case, you can ask them, then why did God give us the law to begin with? What, what advantage do we as the Jewish people have? And Paul's gonna kinda of address this in different ways throughout the letter, but this is where he starts out. So here's the obvious question. But there is a second question that Paul also picks up that should also be implicit in the back of the mind. What about that faith that, came, that Paul introduced this righteousness that comes through faith that he said right at the back and he, and he hasn't mentioned since. He says, doesn't that have something to do with it? Well, we'll find out. So again, first of all, the obvious question. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? And Paul answers this question this way. Much in every way. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. And I love what Paul does here. Paul doesn't give just, here's this list, here's the 10 reasons of the benefits of being, being, being part of the Jewish people. And I think most people today, if you look at the history of the Jewish people, you know, whether it be not just going back to the Holocaust, not what's going on in the Middle East today, not what's going on in, in college campuses and things like that, but just going through their whole history, I'm like, they're probably asking, yes, what advantage is there? Because it's been a rough go for us. But listen to the way Paul answers. He answers, it's like, it's actually, if we think about it, it's kind of a dumb question. Do you know what you have been given out of all the different people on this planet? He says this, first of all, you have been entrusted with the very words of God. The word there, entrusted, literally means God put his faith to give you his holy words. 
right? And his words there are not just the law, but basically what we would call the Hebrew scriptures, the prophets, and, and all those, those different words. The word could be translated as the oracles, or again, the very words of God, the revelation of God. He said, that just ends it, should end it right there in the discussion. I kind of thought of a few different analogies, but the first one that came in, which is a terrible analogy, but it kind of made me laugh and chuckle when I thought of it, so I'll just keep it in and, and I'll apologize in advance. But when I thought of this, this is, this is the first it thought that came into my mind. Imagine, you, you know, you go home in the afternoon and all of a sudden you get a knock on, the fr- on your front door and you open up and as you open up the door, there's a bunch of scary looking kind of burly big men with wearing dark suits, sunglasses, earpieces, and then you look out behind them and you see a bunch of like extended like Ford Explorer or limousine, things like this. And then pulling out of one is, is, you know, Joe Biden. And he's like walking towards you. He's got like this seemingly, you know, um, pretty serious looking briefcase of secure. And he walk, asks to come in. They, you know, they scout in your house and he wants to sit down. You're like, what did I do to deserve this? And he says, well, we've got word that a very important document is under threat of being stealing, and we're trying to think who we can entrust it with, and I know you're Canadians, but we're giving it to you to hold on to. They open it up, and there is the Declaration of Independence given to you for security, right? You're holding on. Now, again, it's an absurd thing, but it's this idea that out of all the people on the planet, you've got this priceless document, and it's up to you to take care of it. Right, one of the things about responsibility, there is a burden that goes with it. Right, the greater the, the, greater the responsibility, the bigger the burden. But at the same time, is there any higher honor that you can give somebody than by giving them responsibility? It's one of the most important things that we can do. I love those pictures, just like a picture of you know, someone giving over the keys, and that definitely strikes home because I have two young teenagers who just recently got their driver's license in the last couple of years, and there was nothing more painful for letting them drive the car for the very first time. And in fact, every single time, because they're away at school and they don't drive a lot, and I give them the car, I'm just like, okay, <laughs> take it, right? <laughs> and as soon as they're out that door, I'm, that's when I, my prayer life is at its best. <laughs> I'm just going to be saying I still pray every time. He says, you've been given this incredible thing. That's pretty awesome. What do you mean, what kind of advantage do you have? Now, the next thing he does is he says, well, wait a minute. And he, he can guess their next argument, but, but in the process, we've failed with it. Right, there's a bunch of people who've let you down. We haven't kept the, we haven't, we haven't, you know, kept your word safe. We haven't obeyed it ourselves. And then Paul basically says this, well, just because you haven't been truthful with it, just because you haven't faithful, doesn't change that God is still faithful. That God is still true. Listen to, um, to verse three. I'm calling this just an absurd inference. He goes, what if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. I don't, just for sake of time, I'm not gonna go through the next number of verses, um, but this argument basically says this, well, isn't God's reputation in some way dependent on how we behave, right? The better we are, doesn't that make God look better? Or maybe it's the worse we are and that looks God better? And, and he says, no, no. Regardless of how we live, how we act, God is true, God is faithful, regardless of how we are. And here's kind of an important thought when I was thinking about this ourselves. One of the things that I have found over the years, I've had lots of very, very sincere and, and troubling conversations with many, many different people. Lots of people I have I've spent with who've grown up in the church and have decided to walk away from their faith for a number of different reasons. Lots of people who hear I'm a pastor and don't want nothing to do with Christianity or the Christian, Christian faith and usually will explain the reasons why they're either walking away or don't want anything to do it. And oftentimes it goes like this, well, Christians are a bunch of hypocrites, right? Well, they only care about your money. 
Sometimes you hear these things in their troubling stories. He goes, oh, I had a bad experience with my Sunday school teacher, my youth leader, my, my pastor. People say, well, I just see what we always see on the TV and all those preachers that are on the TV, they're always getting into scandals, they're always making a mess of things. Right, sometimes you go, oh, those Christians are just a bunch of right-wing political bigots and whatever. Sometimes it might even be more personal. It's like, because there's this tragedy that happened in my life. Why did God take away this person that I love so much? And all of those things can cloud us, can all be true, can all, all be real. But just because we feel something or experience something subjectively does not mean something is not true, right? Either Jesus died for the sins of mankind or he didn't. Either Jesus rose from the dead from the, rose from the dead, or he didn't. Either God is the judge and is real or he isn't. And regardless how we feel, that doesn't change what may be actually truthful. Think of it this way, I just see Scott here and a couple months ago, maybe a year ago, Scott and I, we, we got up nice and early to, to go and visit some students and, at Heritage and Scott speaking in chapel, it was kind of fun. And I think the first thing we did was we stopped at Tim Hortons to, you know, to get some important uh, fuel. Um, <laughs> Now imagine as we're getting up, and I think it was about like 6, 6.30, we met to, to, to get on the road, and I went to Scott, hey, do you want to stop and grab a coffee and a donut? And S- Scott says, mm, no, I don't believe in Tim Hortons. I'm like, what? What do you mean you don't believe in Tim Hortons? Well, I had a bad donut once. <laughs> now, <laughs> the funny thing is I did the same an- analogy to, to someone in the first service, and he goes, you know what, that's truthful, I hate Tim Hortons. I had a bad coffee once, and from, from that moment on, Tim Hortons <laughs> is dead to me. <laughs> so, right? Right, whether Tim Hortons is real or not is, isn't dependent if we had a rude customer service or we had a bad donut. Right. It may cloud how we view it. And God's saying this, depending on how we act or not act does not determine whether God is true or God is faithful. And then after he goes through this, Paul brings it back. And again, just remember, this is again a number of traditional-minded Jewish people who are worried about the corruption of, of these Gentiles coming in. And then he reminds them again, back to this, we've got to be careful because you should acknowledge this. And what I'm going to call this is our unavoidable, unrighteous reality. Maybe in modern parlance, I, I like to call this as Paul bringing the receipts. Verse 9 says this, what shall we conclude? Are we any better Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles are alike under sin. Right, he says we're all actually sinners. You can go and blame that. You may not like all those things, but if you actually are honest, we're in the same boat. And then Paul, and I won't go read through all these, but he just lists a whole bunch of Old Testament scriptures, and I've included all the references, eight of them to be there, and all of them refer to them not being perfect, missing the mark, right, not being righteous in and of themselves, right? He's saying, these are your own words, these are your own documents, this is the whole treasure, and what does it say? What I'm telling you, right? He's not going to an outside source, he's going to what they already agree on. I didn't do the fact checking myself, but I read one commentary last week about this, and he says, what's unique about all these references, if you read them in context, they all say that the Jews are all messed up, they don't don't have the righteousness of themselves, so God has to come in and save them anyway. Right? They, they point to an outside God coming in to, to rescue them and save the day. And then Paul again returns to that question, okay, if this is the case, then what is the advantage of it is to be the Jew, right? If we've been given the law, what does, that, what does that mean? And this is where we get the second answer, verse 19. Now we know whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, and just pay attention to this, we'll come back to this in a moment, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world held accountable to God. We'll come back, that's the error we'll come back to in a moment. But therefore, no one will be declared righteous. And it, one of the things that you need to do, just in, especially in this chapter, is when you hear the word justify and righteous to underline, and I'll explain that in a second. But just again, notice how prominent it is. Therefore, no one who will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law 
Now listen to this, this is why we have the advantage. Rather, through the law, we became conscious of sin. What does the law do? What is the second advantage? Once you are given it to realize, man, I, I, I can't measure up to this thing. Maybe another way to look at it is, is a simple way that's especially a little bit, um, hitting a little closer to home. But I don't know if when you drive around on these roads in this country, they've got those annoying little speed signs that, that go up. Um, I just assume they're recommendations. Um, I learned about a week ago, they're, they're a little bit more than recommendations. <laughs> um, it's been about 15 years, but I got reminded. Um, <laughs> That 80 apparently wasn't a suggestion, and 109 is probably not too ideal. That's, sorry, just <laughs> confession time. <laughs> but imagine I'm driving around, and the police officer pulls me over, and he says, uh, do you know how, what the speed limit is here? And I'm like, yes, I do, officer. <laughs> well, it got me off that one. He goes, do you know how fast you're going? I said, apparently a little bit faster, I guess. Right? I'm still held responsible. What if I'm not around here and I didn't, you know, wasn't paying attention, I don't know the, the signs. Still going to be held responsible. But when it comes to the will of God and getting the law, the one thing every Jew should have realized, it's like, I can't do this on my own. <laughs> there has to be another way, another righteousness. And I want to just go back to that one little thing where it says this, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. And this is a little bit of a scary thought, but one of the ways to understand Romans, and it, it might be hard for us to just pick it out when, when we're reading through it the way we are, but is to actually picture it as a courtroom. And the judge is the holy God, creator of heaven and earth. And this idea of being righteousness is, is, is actually a legal term. I'll explain it in just a moment. But we have to defend ourselves before this holy judge. Now, one of these things that, that, that happens, and this also goes back to where that idea of when my kids just go, no, just, just stop, please stop is in that tradition, and it could be in a more formal court setting, or it could be just even at the gate with the elders, in a very, but still in a very public setting. There would be somebody, there would be a judge who, who, or elder who was appointed to deal with a situation, and say there was a charge against me, or even I was a witness to, bring, uh, to, to share in, in the course of a case. Once I'm finished speaking, once I'm giving my defense, when I'm done, what they would do is they would cover their mouth like this so that nobody could hear them and they're speaking. It was to signify that I'm resting my case. This is all I have to say. And the reason why they covered their mouth is quite literally they didn't want it to be closed for them. Because what would happen is if they were going in and they were delivering and they were making their defense, and all of a sudden the judge is listening to it and says, I think this guy's lying. I think this guy's giving irrelevant information that is not helping this situation. I think this guy is full of it or digging his hole. Then what he could do is he could, uh, he could instruct somebody to strike him across the jaw and basically saying, you're finished, I'm closing your case for you. And what Paul is saying is if we're before a holy God and we want to defend our case before him, we better be silent before we even start. Because <laughs> ultimately, he's eventually going to close our mouths for us. He's going to silence everyone. Right? Because he is the perfect judge. We can't pull the wool over his eyes. But as we're reading this, again, in the back of our mind, there has to be another alternative. So that, again, opening... Verse, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written. The righteous will live by faith. And finally, Paul brings this up again. He shows us this alternative option. Verse 21, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law, right? This is something that's different from just how hard we work or what our behavior is like has been made known 
to which the law and the prophets testify. Again, what this law, this gift that you've been entrusted with all points to this thing, this other way um, outside of the law itself. Verse 22, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. And then verse 23, which is one of the most well-known verses of all of Romans, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see what, again, Paul is doing? Traditional Jewish people, right? Culturally conservative, morally in all these ways, and you're so worried about this outside influence. And again, probably rightfully so. They've got good merit for it. But he said, let's get one thing straight. We're all on the same level, Jew or Gentile. All have sinned. All of us have fallen short. And then there's verse 24 that should be just as known as well as verse 23. And are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. Paul, the next few verses, explains what that means. God presented him, this is Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement. That means a covering, right? Something that covers over all of our sins. Through the faith in his blood, he did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. What's he saying? He goes, the world's a mess. And we're responsible for making it a mess. And at some point, God has to step in and answer it, and somebody's got to pay the cost for that mess. And so for that, it was his son, Jesus Christ. So Jesus, so that the sins can't just go on unpunished forever, takes that on himself, right? To realize that he is a just and holy God who deals with the ramifications of sin. But then he says, because of that, and because he took that in our place, then through that, it also gives us the chance to claim that for ourselves, right? The justice of Jesus we can claim for ourselves, right? It's a quite literally an incredible thought. Now, just as we end, I want to go back and I want you to think through these words righteousness again and what they mean and what they mean in this setting. He next goes on, I love this. He goes, where then is the boasting? It is excluding. What is he saying? He goes, if it's based on faith, if it's not based on works, it's not based on good behavior, whatever, then none of us have a chance to boast on how good we are. Right, that makes that irrelevant because we're claiming something outside of ourselves. He says this, it is excluded on what principles? On that observing the law? No, but on that of faith. And I love this next statement. This is one of those major, mega, kind of earth-shattering statements of Paul and Romans. Right, this is kind of up there with there's neither, no, neither Jew or Gentile, sla- uh, free or slave, male or female, is kind of one of, up in that level. He goes, for we maintain that man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith, right? Jew and Gentile alike. It's again that beautiful picture of the gospel that brings them together. But I want you to now just kind of, as we end, just think about those words, that righteousness. Oftentimes when we think of the word righteousness, we think of it as, you know, if we say somebody is self-righteous, usually we think somebody is high on themselves. But we can also use it, we might say, you know, I see Maria Jones, Maria Jones, she's such a righteous person, but I mean it, she's a good person, right? She's a good, moral, upstanding individual. That's not exactly what it's talking about here. This is actually a legal term. And the term there means to be in right standing, right? To be declared in the right, as opposed to being declared in the wrong. And that word justify or justification is actually the same word, same root word, means that God has taken us from being in the wrong and put us into the right. So we've gone from wrong standing into right standing. Right, that's the idea again of that picture we've called this transformed. We've 
transformed from somebody who was in wrong standing before a holy God to someone because of faith through Jesus is now in right standing. We're claiming Christ's righteousness, not our own, and that puts us now in right standing before a holy and perfect God. I want you to think of it this way, and I've kind of used this example before, but I think it's kind of fun. And we sometimes get, have a hard time to get our brain around it, so here's a little bit more humans. Imagine tomorrow I decide I'm gonna hop in a plane, fly over to London, and I show up in London and I, I come to you know, Buckingham Palace or Windsor Palace or wherever Charles and Camilla are, and I decide I'm just gonna go and have lunch with them. And I, you know, I sh- knock on the door, like, hey, I'm here. Can I help you? You know, the, the, the security guard says, yeah, I, I'm, I'm here to see King Chuck. You know, tell him Jeff's here to see him. Now, what's the likelihood Charles is going to let me in or this person? Oh, well, so it's Jeff. Okay, I, of course, he's been waiting for you, right? I will be ushered out very quickly, probably by security guards. Um, and they might be not be taking me to a jail, but a, an insane asylum or something like that. And I'm sure one of them goes, what made you think you could see the king of England? And I just, my answer would be like, well, I, I'm a good person, I'm a nice guy. You know, I even stopped at some, go- at, a, at a girl guide stand and bought some cookies for Camilla, you know, like, uh, why, why wouldn't he? Like, you're insane. <laughs> it's the king, you can't, you can't just. Now, imagine as I'm being, you know, rudely escorted out of the palace and or the palace grounds, all of a sudden Prince William shows up. You notice I'm picking Prince William and not Harry because that, that, <laughs> that might not help out so much. And all of a sudden, William says to me, hey, Jeff, good to see you. What are you doing here? Are you here to see my dad? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm here to see your dad. He's with me, and then he can take me in, right? My standing has gotten improved a lot better because I'm not coming in on my own merit. I'm coming on in with somebody who already knows the family. He's got it, and he says, That's kind of the way it works. And I love this picture. This is an incredible picture of grace. But it's hard for us to get our heads around. But at the end of the day, it's this. The Bible does say that we will be answerable for everything we do in this life. And we can stay on trial for that and try to defend it. But Paul says if we try it that way, he's going to silence us. Or we could just take this invitation, this incredible gift that is offered through Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf and claim it. And the one thing that is wonderful about this gift of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ that justifies us even though we're still sinners <laughs> is that it's not based on how good we are, how well we've kept the law. Doesn't mean these things aren't important. It's based on how good and great Jesus is. And that's what makes it wonderful, beautiful, almost too simple. That's why I love it. But the other part why some people really hate this and find it scary, because if it's based on Jesus, then it's not based on me. <laughs> and there's a lot of things in this life we can get by by our own strengths, by our own, our own talents, and our own gifts. But I don't know if I want to take that chance before a holy God, before the creator of heaven and earth, and just try to get on his good size by impressing him. My guess is he's not going to be overly impressed by Jeff Bell. <laughs> partly why there's no boasting, (laughs) because the work is already done in advance for us. It's funny, when I think of it this way, as Paul puts it, again, I apologize for this reference, but I couldn't help but think of that old classic, Clint Eastwood, Dirty Harry, (laughs) right? (laughs) And I I did remove the gun from from the picture before (laughs) I put it on there. I thought I might get in trouble for putting that. But you remember when he says, tell yourself, are you feeling lucky? Punk. (laughs) can remove the punk part. But it's again this picture when we're trusting ourselves to eternity before a holy and perfect God. It's either trusting on the gift and the invitation that he's given, the righteousness given through his son Jesus Christ, 
or whether it's based on our own worth that we think we can bring into it. Whether we think we're lucky enough to get past the guards. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I don't think I'm lucky enough. <laughs> I feel more like a punk. <laughs> we're gonna call the worship team just to close our service off in song. But again, if, we don't, if you don't know and haven't trusted the Lord and putting your faith in him to be the covering for your sin, and you want to know what that looks like, if we can pray with you after the service or in the coming days, we'd be so grateful to do that. Worship team, come and close us off. Mm-hmm.